Hey there. Good morning, R4DS Slack channel. We're going to go ahead and get going here with chapter three of Bayes' rule. In this chapter, we'll be studying the beta binomial Bayesian model. And as we can see in front of us, we will learn how to interpret and tune a continuous beta prior model to reflect your prior information about our probabilities pi. We will learn how to interpret and communicate features out of prior and posterior models using properties such as the mean, mode, and variance. And we will construct the fundamental beta binomial model for the proportions. Um, conventional usage of Greek letters, and we'll be also trying out these pack R packages here. This beta binomial model is used for when we want to look for something with a proportion that is our response variable is a proportion. Examples include the proportion of people who use public transit, the proportion of trains that are delayed, the proportion of people who prefer cats to dogs, and so forth. The beta binomial model provides the tools we need to study the proportion of interest, pi, in each of these settings. And in case you're curious, yes, pi is a pretty conventional um, symbol for a set of probabilities. It does come up in other probability settings in other probability textbooks. To get us started in an example, the first model we are going to construct is based on a scenario where you are the campaign manager for Michelle for president campaign in the state of Minnesota. So far, we have conducted 30 opinion polls. Michelle's support is generally around 45%, but has been as low as 35% and as high as 55%. This is going to form a basis for our prior. Previous cohorts have um, inserted some topical pictures, and this is what we think of when we hear the name Michelle these days. From last week, the example of Kasparov's probability of beating Deep Blue at chess was a discrete example, because in that case, we greatly oversimplified the reality to fit our framework of the Bayesian models, because in last chapter, remember, we had our set pi be either 0 0.2, 0 0.5, or 0.8. That's a discrete setting. However, here in the reality of Michelle's election support versus the previous example of Kasparov's chess skill, pi could be any value between zero and one. This is more nuanced as we're using a continuous prior probability model. So what we're looking at now are probability density functions for continuous models rather than discrete models. I hope the folks in the cohort don't mind. I added a few more math equations to the slides. I, we are here refreshing our memories about what a probability density function is. If pi is a continuous random variable, then we express the probability density function that is a function of the randomness. The proportions have to be greater than or equal to zero. The area under the curve is totals to one or 100%. And we express probabilities as a slice or section of that area in the integral representation. So we're going to try out this beta distribution for our prior knowledge. The beta distribution, as a quick side note, looks like the normal distribution. It looks like a bell curve. But because it has two hyperparameters, it does not have to be symmetric. Uh, this comes up in other areas, such as financial investing, where you do not necessarily want to have a bell curve because of things like risk aversion, where 
uh, people tend to invest lesser amounts of money than more money. In this example about the election campaign, we are um, under the assumptions or the prior that the candidate has about 45% support. So if we put in a 45 for now, 55 for the remainder of the of the 100% of 45, 55 uh, setting for the beta distribution sounds reasonable right now. The beta distribution is implying a distribute uh, this bell shaped curved here. And like the prompt says, we have some polling results that tend to be between 25 and 55%. By choosing this 45, 55 for the hyperparameters, the expected value points us right back at 45%, and the mode is similarly close to 45%. This plot beta function comes from the authors and their Bayes rule package. In case you're wondering about these R parameters here, mean and mode, you could turn those to true and it'll quickly plot those as solid and dash vertical lines as well. This is where we gather some new data by conducting another opinion poll. On this occasion, we asked 50 people who they are supporting and 30 of them are supporting Michelle. So note that the prior probability had an average of 45%. This new information has a proportion of 60%. Connecting this to the ideas of the previous chapter, with the 50 people polled, we look at the likelihoods that the probabilities are either 0 0.1, 0 0.2, all the way up to 0.9 the likelihoods are these black vertical lines in this schematic here. Since this new information is at 60%, the likelihood is the highest also at 60%. Collecting these likelihoods, the vertical black lines, another way we could also have this graph here, which again, has a maximum likelihood where pi is 60%. All right, so now we have two pieces of our Bayesian model in place, the beta prior, and then the binomial for dependence on the polling data based on the possible probabilities. Put together, you, you could get a sense of why this is called the beta binomial model. What we observed so far is that the prior and the data do not completely agree. In the graph, the prior is in yellow, and the data rescaled likelihood is in blue. The prior was a bit more pessimistic about Michelle's election support than the recent data. But as we discussed in chapter one, we want to be mindful in our Bayesian philosophy that both insights are valuable. We shouldn't ignore the new poll, and likewise, we shouldn't throw out the old information. I also like how the previous cohorts noted, that's also great life advice, isn't it? So thinking like Bayesians, we can construct a posterior model of pi, which combines the information from the prior with that from the data. The posterior will give, of the likelihood given the new poll results, in which again, 30 people said yes out of the 50 that they would support Michelle. So with that said, for people who are watching the video, we again have our prior in yellow, our likelihood in blue, 
looking at this graph at the bottom, try to get a sense of where do you think the posterior would be? Which one of those graphs would be the most reasonable out of those three choices? So now we're looking at this here. I'll, we, in the convenient helper function plot beta binomial, also from the Bayes rule package, we put in the hyperparameters from the prior. We put in the numerator and denominator from the new information. And we get the posterior distribution in this case in green. And you observe that it's in between the prior and the likelihood. That is from the quiz on the previous slide, the correct choice was B because this posterior model strikes a balance between the prior and the likelihood. The base rules package also has the summarized beta binomial function with the prior parameters, the new information proportion. And we observe that in this scenario about election support for Michelle, the mean has increased from 45% to 50%. And we could also observe that the variance has decreased in size. Let me just say that again with the picture on the screen. From the yellow to the green, the mean has increased from 45% to 50%. From the yellow to the green, from the prior to the posterior, the variance has decreased. The nice thing about doing these calculations in a pro programming environment and with a language such as R is that simulations can be done. So we're going to simulate the posterior model for Michelle support pi. We begin by simulating a 10,000 values for the proportion from the beta distribution. Remember our prior was with parameters 45 and 55. The function in R is called R beta. And then similarly for going towards the likelihood, of getting the data y based on each value of proportion pi. That's going to be the binomial stage of the beta binomial model. So we're going to use the R binomial function. The results of one simulation are shown below. In general, the greater Michelle support, the better her poll results tend to be. The highlighted pairs in the bluish greenish color illustrate the eventual observed poll result. That is the 30 out of 50 in the newer information. Would likely arise if the underlying support was somewhere between the range of 0.4 and 0.6. So a few things going on here. Let me flip back. In the development of the prior information, we saw that some polls were as low as 35 and as high as 55. Starting to incorporate the new information and the data, running a simulation thereof, we are trying to under we're trying to estimate the true proportion of people who would support this candidate. 
And the uh, simulation is pointing us now towards a range of 0.4 to 0.6. So we have again 10,000 simulations in into this plot here. If we focus on the ones where it lines up with a new information where 60% of people would support this candidate, so 30 out of 50 on the y-axis, using a little bit of D prior there, we see that um, amongst those results, if we get a quick sample, Again, the proportions are somewhere between 0.4 and 0.6. Looking at these dots another way, these uh, bluish dots in the default ggplot colors where that matches the new data we could also think and visualize this with a density plot once again the new information seems to be pointing us towards a range between 0.4 and 0.6 finishing off this simulation by tackling its randomness, we see that the average is 0.5 and the standard deviation is about 0 0.04. Note that when this matches up with the helper function, that the new average is 0.5 and the standard deviation is about 0 0.04. The authors were showing that what's going on in the background is this simulation. The authors also noted that in this focus on the results where y equals 30 out of 50, out of the 10,000 points in the simulation, the observations that did align with the new data was only about 200 out of 10,000. So the textbook authors noted that maybe they could have uh, ran the simulation longer, maybe uh, for five times as many observations to, to 50,000 overall. Let's think of another case study here. We're going back in time a bit to this popular um, study by Stanley Milgram back in 1963. This was published in the Journal of Abnormal and Psych Social Psychology. In this study, subjects were asked to deliver an electric shock to an actor under the ruse of a study on the effect of punishment on memory. That is, uh, you, the test subject, were seated in a chair. You got to see this other person, and you were told that they were testing you on electric shocks and whether it affects the person's memory. It turns out the person you were looking at, you didn't know that they were a hired actor. Meanwhile, the proctor would tell you to press a button to administer an electric shock to what is to you a stranger, a different person. So in reality, what was being tested was obedience to authority in conflict with personal conscience. Because what we're assuming is that you wouldn't necessarily want to give pain to a stranger. But what would happen if someone told you to hit that button that would cause the electric shock? So I'm going to try this out 
with the concepts of the beta binomial distribution in mind. Say a mathematician came along or a data scientist and recommended a beta 110 prior model. We have a bit of a quiz here. What does that reveal about the psychologist's prior understanding of pi? Give yourself a minute if you're watching this video. Do you think A, that they don't have an informed opinion? B, they are fairly certain that a large proportion of people will do what authority tells them? Or C, they are fairly certain that only a small proportion of people will do what authority tells them? I is the pro we're aiming for the proportion of people who will follow the instructions of hitting that button and causing the electric shock. Pi is the proportion of people who will obey those instructions. Nevertheless, we do not know that number in advance, so that's why we're that's why they were conducting that experiment. Let's go ahead and plot the beta 110. We get a shape like this. So this graph has most of its density at the beginning. If we compute the average, we get an average of about 9%. This is at one to 10 odds, with alpha equals one, the mode happens to be zero. But moreover, in context, the psychologist's prior understanding expected that only a small proportion of people will do what authority tells them. So again, this was constructed at about one to 10 odds. Well, what do you think actually happened? It turns out obedience to authority won out. Many people hit that button to sh shock the stranger, you know, because they were told to. The prior was not supported by the evidence. In fact, what happened was that 26 out of 40 participants inflicted the maximum electric shock. Uh, as a side note, uh, this was back in 1963, at least here in the United States, that was still about a decade before there was a standardized um, set of procedures for ethics in research. And also, um, in retrospect, this study, Milgram, while it's famous in psychology circles, itself might be scrutinized for ethics and validity and replicability. And the authors did want to note that, in general, people who are doing these experiments or uh, data scientists who are modeling the results should be mindful of the ethics. So let's bring this back to our Bayesian thoughts. In the prior, though they started out with an understanding that fewer than 25% of people would inflict the most service shock, the data gave a strong counter that it was much more than 25%. So now with this posterior, maybe we should move this figure, this proportion, maybe be between 30 and 70%. So we'll try this out with the helper functions. In the plot beta binomial functions, we'll put the hyperparameters from the prior here in alpha and beta. We'll put the numerator and denominator of the proportion here, y and n. Remember that 26 out of 40 people inflicted the maximum electrical shock. The prior, once again, is in yellow. The scaled likelihood is in blue. And now the updated posterior in green strikes a balance 
between the prior and the likelihood. Looking at the results numerically, the average increased from 9% to about 53%. That is the percentage of people who would hit that button to shock a stranger increased from about 9% to about 53%. Variance decreased slightly. Okay, folks, so let's just gather our thoughts here and our ideas. Uh, we don't necessarily have to read off all the math. I just left that there for convenience. We can build a beta binomial model for an unknown proportion anywhere between zero and one. That is when we are aiming for a response variable, that's a proportion, that's a percentage between zero and one and also where our response variable is now continuous in nature. In this chapter, we tried out a couple of examples of what's called a beta binomial model, beta for the prior and binomial towards the updating with the likelihood. As we saw in the example, the beta model can be tuned to reflect the prior probability, such as what in the Michelle election campaign, the prior probability was 45%. So we went with a beta model that was also aimed at 45%. In the Milgram example, going into the experiment, the previous literature, the previous experiments kind of pointed out that people would not obey instructions. So then the folks went into that experiment in, in the same way. And here in the modeling, we built a beta distribution with that pessimism in mind. We then collect data. And then going towards the likelihood function, it, this gets simulated based on binomial models, based on various values of your proportion pi. And we build up the likelihood functions thereof using um, the beta distribution in mind. Of course, the binomial distribution is used in settings where there are only two outcomes. So in the election support model, the two outcomes were either yes or no, would you support this candidate? In the Milgram example, the two outcomes are um, yes or no, did they hit the button to shock the, the stranger? Connecting these ideas with the previous chapter, via Bayes' rule, we have the binomial model produce a beta posterior. So once the Bayes' rule gets carried out, the result for the posterior it brings us back to the beta distribution. So we call this a conjugate beta prior because we say that the underlying prior distribution is a conjugate prior for the likelihood because the resulting posterior is in the same family as a prior. So in other words, we started with beta distribution, ran the simulations through a binomial distribution, and ended up with a, another beta distribution. So the beta distribution here is a conjugate prior with the binomial distribution. And this helps with thinking about interpreting the results with the underlying mathematics of it all, because we could still think about the results as a named or popular distribution. That is, if you um, have mastery of the beta distribution, we're still using the beta distribution in the posterior. The It also ends up with a nice formula here 
that when we update the posterior, we could plug in the numbers from the new evidence to get the new hyperparameters. Okay, folks, so that was the chapter three of Bayes' Rule by our wonderful authors, and many thanks to the previous cohort for assembling these notes and forging the ground in front of us. Uh, for my cohort members, uh, we have another rich chapter coming up next week, and if someone could volunteer to facilitate and guide us through that, that would be great. That's it for today. Thank you for being here, and I will see you next week. <laughs>